Dear ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank Insurance Europe and in particular Andreas Brandstetter for the kind invitation and the opportunity to speak to you today. Unfortunately, I'm not able to join you in person in Prague due to other urgent commitments. Insurance Europe was kind enough to ask me to reflect on the issue of protection gaps and on the Solvency II review nonetheless. The topic you have picked for this conference, namely how to close the protection gap and ensure a high level of protection for all, is certainly one of its equally important as its timely. Protection gap seems like a mundane topic, but it's worthwhile to think about them well in advance before a catastrophe hits. That is not only true from an individual perspective, but also from a public policy perspective. If you do not plan ahead, the damage can be multitudes bigger. And if insurance undertakings cannot pitch in, it is often the taxpayer who has to settle the bill. In that sense, dealing with protection gap is not just an issue for private enterprises making the right decisions, but also a question of public policy. I'm sure that you will have plenty of discussions about the obvious examples of protection gaps, such as the risk of business interruption that has become evident with COVID-19 or the difficulty to correctly price the risk of natural disasters. Therefore, I would like to focus on a protection gap that is a slow burn problem, namely the protection gap that arises from demographic change and the inability of public pension systems to deal with that change. I'm talking about the protection gap in retirement that many people face. That is, of course, an area where insurance companies can help out by providing investment-based insurance products such as life insurance policies. Of course, the flip side of the coin is that we need to set a regulatory framework that allows insurance companies to provide such policies with attractive yields. For that, Solvency II is a key policy tool. As the European Parliament's Rapporteur for the Solvency II Review, I would like to use the ongoing revision of Solvency II to make European insurance companies more agile and more competitive. The overarching objective, though, is to put insurance companies in a position to offer policies that are attractive and safe. The current calibration of Solvency II is very conservative, and I believe there are still some buttons we can push in order to make European insurance companies more competitive without compromising on financial stability. I see two main avenues that we should look at in this regard. The first one are the technical details of the calibration of certain key variables under the headline long-term guarantees, such as the extrapolation of the interest rate curve, the prudential treatment of equity and long-term investments, or the adjustment of the risk margin. Many of those variables are currently dealt with as part of the delegated regulation and unfortunately the European Commission has suggested to keep it that way in its legislative proposal. To me, this is not an acceptable approach, though. To put it simply, those are the variables that make or break an insurance company. Little tweaks in those numbers can free up billions of euros or they can tie up billions up euros. So finding the right trade-off on those numbers is a political decision that we cannot simply delegate to EOPA. EOPA has a simple mandate to keep insurance companies safe. Therefore, for EOPA there is no trade-off to be made. That is why they will ultimately always go for the most conservative and most cautious calibration. While this is the ultimate EOPA's job, it might not be in the best interest of policyholders and it might not be in the interest of wider society. That is why, as a European Parliament, we need to establish a way to be actively and meaningfully involved in the design of those Level 2 standards. The second way to boost insurance companies' ability to promote long-term investment 
is by reducing operational complexity and operational burdens, particularly for those insurance companies that are smaller and have a low risk profile. As you will recall, we have introduced such a regime for smaller and less complex banks in the last revision of the Capital Requirements Directive. I believe that this approach can serve as a useful blueprint for the insurance world. Insurance regulation is overdue for a healthy dose of proportionality. A one-size-fits-all approach is usually very convenient for the supervisory authority, but it's not for the supervised entities, particularly for the smaller ones. The Commission has picked up on the idea of introducing more proportionality and has introduced the notion of low-risk undertakings in their proposal. That is a very good starting point. However, I believe we can still improve on that concept. The criteria applied by the Commission are often overly restrictive and need some adjusting. Of course, only because there is now a distinct class of insurance companies that is classified as low risk, does not mean that we are done with reducing the regulatory burden. Many of the reporting requirements in Solvency II, for example, are quite burdensome and often of little use to a wider audience. So here we can definitely get rid of some red tape and bureaucracy without causing any harm. To sum things up, the Solvency II review is a big chance to improve on the current regime. If you get things right and turn the right screws, a smart revision of the current rules can help to close the protection gap and can contribute to many people having a much more comfortable retirement. We must not waste that chance. So thank you very much and have a productive conference.